On the 5th of October, 1915, my great-uncle, Lieutenant Aubrey Hastings of the 7th East Surrey Regiment, was killed in France, blown to pieces in his trench during the Battle of Loos. I grew up with his story, reading the unhappy letters that he wrote amid the poppies of the battlefield, along with those of a grandfather and another great-uncle who survived. But this is the first time I've visited the cemetery at fouquier le bethune where Aubrey's buried, one of some 900,000 British Empire dead of the First World War. Almost everyone in this country shares such links with that catastrophe for our forefathers and for Europe. It's a funny business, looking down at the last resting place of one of my own family, whom I never met, who died in a struggle that I've spent decades reading about. Its horror is not in doubt. But where I part company from what we might call the Blackadder take on history is to believe that it was also futile, that it didn't matter which side won. In the 21st century, the British people are deeply wedded to the idea that the Second World War was our good war, the first our bad one. But what if we'd stayed out? What if Germany had won? In my opinion, the deaths of Aubrey Hastings and hundreds of thousands of his comrades were assuredly a great tragedy, but they were not for nothing. Many British people honor the men who fought and died with a mixture of sorrow and a sense of waste. A belief that no cause could have justified so horrendous a sacrifice. But a hundred years after the outbreak, it seems time to revisit the reasons we went to war in 1914. I want to argue that far from Britain having plunged into a bloodbath we could have stayed out of, our part in the First World War was tragically necessary. Any exploration of why Britain had to go to war in 1914 must start on the continent of Europe. The spark was ignited in the Balkans on the 28th of June when Gavrilo Princip, a Bosnian Serb, shot dead Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austrian throne. The Empire's rulers immediately determined to exploit the outrage to justify invading neighboring Serbia, where the murder weapons had come from. But the Russians were Serbia's close allies, and they made it plain they would fight to protect their fellow Slavs. Through July 1914, the great continental powers waded ever deeper into crisis. But from the outset, the key player was Germany. On the 6th of July, its rulers pledged the Austrians their unconditional support to smash Serbia, promising to deal with Russia and its own ally, France, if they intervened. Day by day, it became plainer that none of the big players would back down. And thus began the countdown to the First World War. Some historians have argued that once it became clear that Austria and Germany were going to war with France and Russia, we, the British, should simply have left them to get on with it, stayed out. But all that would have come out of a German victory was a fast-forwarded version of today's European Union. I don't buy that. The people who were running Germany cared nothing for democracy or other people's freedoms. Once the shooting started, it became plain that their war aims were little different from those of Hitler 35 years later, excepting only the Jewish genocide. The causes of the war are hugely complicated, with the death of the Archduke only setting in motion existing forces. No one nation deserves all the blame. But there's an overriding case that German recklessness contributed more than anything else to make a conflict intended to settle a local score escalate into a European war. And once the fighting and dying started, it became cruelly apparent that a German victory would be a disaster for Europe. <laughs> 
1914, Germany was by far the most powerful state on the continent, the most advanced society in Europe. Industrially, it was racing ahead of its rivals in every field from pharmaceuticals to automobile design. Socially, it pioneered a welfare state by creating unemployment insurance and old age pensions. German culture was revered across the world. But it became Europe's historic tragedy that the German system of government lagged generations behind everything else in the country. The empire's elected parliament had the largest socialist party in Europe. But while the Reichstag dominated domestic affairs, it was the Kaiser, the so-called Allhighest, Wilhelm II, who still made every key appointment and controlled decisions about war and peace. Wilhelm was a weak man who was sought to masquerade as a strong one, chronically unstable and prone to violent mood swings. He wasn't at heart a warmonger, as of course Hitler was, but he loved to play at soldiers. He offered threats and blandishments to other powers, which he always got in the wrong order. <music> Professor John Rowell has spent a lifetime studying and writing about the Kaiser. How personally influential was Kaiser Wilhelm in the decision for war? Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm took over the reins from uh, his father in 1888 and inherited Bismarck's immense power himself when he threw Bismarck out, but not content with that. He then went back to an almost 18th century notion of monarchy. In other words, he insisted on ruling personally. Uh, with the result, he appointed all ministers, all the chancellors, all the generals, all the admirals himself personally, according to his likes and dislikes. He was an extremely assertive bully. Well, it was just an extraordinary situation that you had a socialist majority, violently anti-militarist majority in the Reichstag, and yet exercising no influence at all, really, over um, this regime and foreign policy. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons, I believe, uh, behind the German general's decision to go to war around about 1914 was the rising tide of democracy at home. The, the thinking was, well, if we leave it too long, we will not be able to get our way and do what we really need to do to make Germany great. So we better go uh, before that time comes. The most powerful institution in Wilhelm's empire, and indeed in all continental Europe, was the German army. The Kaiser was also eager to extend his power across the seas and personally promoted the creation of a big gun navy. This thoroughly alarmed the British, who feared Germany's fleet as a threat to their global trade routes and empire. As Queen Victoria's grandson, Wilhelm retained some respect for her people, but he was determined that neither he nor his empire should defer to them. It's almost as if he feels obliged to be more military and more masculine than any other monarch, perhaps because there's always the whiff of Englishness about him, his mother being English. He was always very keen to say, no, no, no I'm not English, I'm Prussian. I'm, I'm Extremely Prussian. So there's this autocratic uh, side to him, there's extreme militarism, but some of it does come from England. So, for example, the love of the navy, the idea that he has a mission to become the superpower in Europe in place of Britain. He feels he has a right as leader of this new energised Germany after unification. Fear of Germany's might and of its aspirations to dominate Europe prompted Russia and France to forge a close military alliance. Although Britain's government made no firm written commitment, it posted an option on supporting them in the event of war. Many British people recoiled from the idea of joining an alliance with Tsar Nicholas II, whose people had been Britain's enemies through the 19th century. But the fears of Europe's rulers that a general war would result from their rivalries caused every nation to huddle close to its friends. The Germans to the Austrians, the Russians to the French, with the British as cautious maybes. Germany's warlords were haunted by fears of Russia's growing might. Some of them were convinced that challenging the Tsar's armies sooner rather than later offered Germany the best chance of victory. This is one of many German memorials to Prussia's 19th century military triumphs. <laughs> 
Instead of perceiving big wars as we do today, as universal tragedies, the Kaiser's generals, and sometimes Wilhelm himself, believed that trial by battle was an acceptable instrument of policy. All Germany's leaders were insecure, even paranoid, about threats at home from the socialists, abroad from Russia and France, probably backed in a showdown by Britain. In those days, not many people thought seriously about economics. The Kaiser and his generals counted soldiers. They failed to realize that their country was achieving dominance of Europe without firing a shot through its industrial power. By 1914, so many Germans had come to believe that a European clash in arms was inevitable, that their fatalism contributed mightily to bringing this about. The Kaiser, who was almost certainly clinically unstable, was one of three men in Germany who took the key decisions which resulted in war. To this day, historians argue fiercely about which pulled the levers to precipitate disaster. The others were the Chancellor, Theobald von Bethmann Holweg, appointed by Wilhelm, and General Helmut von Moltke, head of the army. The Kaiser and the Chancellor were the ones who, on the 6th of July, promised Austria Germany's support against Serbia. Bethmann Holweg, knowing that Russia was committed to protect the Serbs, pressed the Austrians to hurry their invasion to preempt the Tsar. This has become known as Berlin's blank check keystone of the argument that Germany was most blameworthy for the horrors that followed. <laughs> Professor Sir Hugh Strawn has been studying and chronicling the war for over 30 years. He agrees that Berlin took a huge gamble. The Germans actively encouraged the Austrians not merely to invade Serbia, but to get on and do it even more quickly than they were ready to do it. Yes, partly because I think if they do it quickly, you'll get away with it. You'll be able to crush Serbia, there'll be a Balkan war that is over so quick that nobody will have time to intervene. So the, the, the presumption here is speed. And what Berlin is doing is constantly taking best case advice. You know, will Russia stay out of this war because they're worried there'll be a revolution in Russia? The best answer is that Yes, they will, because there has been a revolution in Russia in 1905, and there might be again. So they work with that assumption, whereas, in fact, of course, the Tsar is going to be put under tremendous pressure to back the Slavs in Serbia. But throughout July, the one nation, surely, that had the power to stop this process, if the Germans had said to the Austrians, stop, do not invade Serbia, there would have not been a general European war, would there? That's right. I think they have the power to say no. I mean, after all, the blank check is central, and, and the blank check is issued by Germany. And Germany then seems to show remarkable insouciance as to how that check will be used. You know, Austria-Hungary still has to cash it. It's Austria-Hungary that has to initiate war. But absolutely, the balance then shifts to Berlin. And if any power has the capacity to stop it, it's Berlin, particularly at the very end of the crisis. Army Chief of Staff Helmut von Moltke, who answered only to the Kaiser, also played a pivotal role. On the 28th of July, Wilhelm and Bethmann Holweg experienced a brief panic attack. The looming war now looked far bigger and graver than they'd bargained for. But Moltke, on his own initiative, telegraphed the Austrians and urged them to hasten their attack. The chief of staff had long argued that if Germany must face a European showdown, it was better to have it before the Russians' big armaments expansion program was complete. At an Imperial Council meeting in December 1912, he's reliably reported as saying, war, and the sooner the better. Annika Mombauer is a German scholar who's written a biography of the Chief of Staff which emphasizes his role in the July crisis. Where did Moltke fit into the decision for war? Well, Moltke very much advocates war. He thinks that war is inevitable in the long run. Uh, he thinks that eventually Russia will become too strong, too militarily powerful for Germany to defeat her, and therefore he uh, creates an atmosphere in which war seems a good solution out of a perceived problem. One thing that seems extraordinary to us about how dysfunctional the German government was in July 1914 is that here you've got Moltke, who's supposed to be just the head of the army, and at a critical moment, July the 28th, he sends a telegram to Vienna, to the Austrians, 
telling him to get on with invading Serbia. And it does seem an extraordinary reflection of both how reckless Moltke could be and of how powerful he was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you're right. He, he does send that telegram. And in Vienna, they end up saying, well, who actually... Who rules in who Berlin? Who rules in Berlin? <laughs> Moltke or Bittmann? Or was it, in fact, the Kaiser? Um, so, yes, you're completely right. He exceeds his authority, if you like, by sending this telegram. Germany's leadership in July 1914 was extraordinarily reckless in accepting the risk that by promoting a small Balkan war, they would trigger a huge European one. When it became plain that the Russians would fight rather than see Serbia go under, the Germans refused to take the one step that could have prevented a general European catastrophe, telling the Austrians to pull back. Instead, they themselves prepared to mobilize against Russia and that's why I believe they deserve most blame for all that followed. On the 28th of July, Austria declared war on Serbia, and two days later, the Tsar ordered his army to mobilize. Germany then issued two ultimatums, one to Russia and another to France, its ally. Neither was expected to accept, and few of the Kaiser's generals wished them to. Berlin then set in motion its hugely ambitious war plan designed to crush France before turning on Russia. Created almost a decade earlier by Moltke's predecessor, Count Alfred von Schlieffen, the plan required an invasion of France by way of its back door through neutral Belgium. It was the German commitment to overrun Belgium which suddenly propelled Britain hitherto a mere spectator of the continental drama, to the forefront of the stage. Under a treaty signed in 1839, this country was among the guarantors of Belgian neutrality. I'm one of those who still wonder whether Britain really would have come in mm -hmm. if it hadn't been for the invasion of Belgium. Molka got this dead wrong, didn't he? He did, he did. Mm. He was in an impossible situation, militarily speaking, or strategically speaking, because Germany is, in a sense, encircled by France in the West and Russia in the East. And the only way he thinks he can win this war is by implementing the so-called Schlieffen Plan. And that plan can only work if France is defeated quickly, and that means invading Belgium. But interestingly, in France, the chief of staff similarly thinks our best chance would be to advance through Belgium, but the politicians, the, the, the diplomats, tell him we can't do that because of Britain. Well, the British told France exactly. on no account going exactly. to Belgium. Exactly, exactly. And so had Germany also respected Belgian neutrality, there would have been all sorts of possibilities right at the end of July and early in August, perhaps to come to a different outcome. Thus, in the first days of August 1914, Germany prepared to invade and crush France in a campaign of 40 days before turning on Russia. Europe had a war, but must the British be in it? Would they fight? Basking in the balmy summer of 1914 and preoccupied by industrial turmoil and threatened Irish civil war, the British people had scant appetite for a continental conflict. But Liberal Prime Minister Herbert Asquith and several key cabinet colleagues were appalled by the prospect of Germany achieving dominance of Europe. They doubted that Britain could merely remain a bystander while this happened. One such was the Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey, who played a critical role. Sir Edward Grey is traditionally seen as a reticent English gentleman whose grand passions were fly fishing and bird watching, both of which he wrote good books about. But more recently, he's become a focus of fierce controversy. Some historians claim that Grey made rash secret commitments to the French, which dragged us unnecessarily into war. For centuries, it had been a British article of faith that a balance of power which denied absolute dominance to any one nation, must be maintained on the continent. Between 1908 and 1914, when Grey was not casting a fly on bright waters, he held secret talks with the French about British support in the event of a German attack. <laughs> 
the Foreign Secretary was less clever and less of a statesman than his admirers thought. But the claim that he should be damned for dragging Britain into an unnecessary war doesn't stand up. I suggest that Grey was a realist about the difficulty, indeed impossibility, of Britain simply standing by doing nothing while Germany conquered Europe. If the French and Russians had been beaten, as they almost certainly would have been if Britain hadn't come in, who can imagine a victorious Germany allowing Britain to continue ruling the waves and the world's financial system any more than Hitler would have done if Churchill had tried to strike a deal with him in 1940? Nothing Gray said beforehand could have deterred the Germans because they had weighed Britain's military power and discounted it. The little British army seemed incapable of influencing a huge clash of continental hosts. The Royal Navy was thought irrelevant because, in the Kaiser's scornful words, dreadnoughts have no wheels. The Foreign Secretary's secret and unwritten assurances to France seem to me to have reflected not warmongering but prudent and essential precaution. In July 1914, by proposing an immediate European conference, Gray did all that he could to avert war. Sir Michael Howard is Britain's most distinguished living historian. He and I have spent many hours discussing the vast puzzle of 1914 and, crucially, whether Britain could have done more to avert disaster. Gray's proposal, which they rejected out of hand to address the confrontation between Austria-Hungary and Serbia by having a peace conference, it wasn't a contemptible proposal, was it? If no, they wanted a no, diplomatic it was, outcome. I mean, it was absolutely typical, typical Gray thing to do, a typical sort of liberal solution. Uh, and uh, well, the it, Germans rejected it flatly. The Germans rejected it flatly because this sort of meant letting down the Austrians and they were not going to let down the Austrians. There was this sense throughout all classes in Austria, it is time to finish with the Serbs. If we don't finish with the Serbs, they will nibble us to death. This is the moment to strike. The Germans, knowing, knowing this was the case, were not going to bring in the Austrians to debate about what their future was going to be. Um, so to that extent also, you could say that the, the Germans were responsible for not, not letting there be a peaceful settlement. On the 2nd of August, the Germans issued an ultimatum to King Albert of Belgium, demanding passage for their armies. He flatly refused and appealed to Britain as a guarantor of his country's neutrality. Thus, it fell to Sir Edward Grey to convince a still reluctant British Parliament of the necessity for Britain to join the war on the continent. On the afternoon of the 3rd of August, Grey delivered the most important speech of his life to the House of Commons. By now, most of the Cabinet believed that Britain must fight in the name of Belgium's rights. Could this country, Gray demanded, stand by and watch the direst crime that ever stained human history and thus become participators in the sin? He added, We should, I believe, sacrifice our respect and good name before the world and should not escape the most serious and grave consequences. This was one of those extraordinary parliamentary occasions that changed history. It persuaded much of the Liberal Party, hitherto bitterly hostile to intervention, now to support it, as the Conservative opposition already did. Thus, on the 4th of August, 1914, after Berlin rejected an ultimatum demanding its withdrawal from Belgium, Britain declared war on Germany. Was Belgium the real reason that Britain went to war in 1914, or as some historians nowadays try to argue, well, it was just a pretext that the British government really wanted to fight anyway. Yeah. Well, I would tend to say it's both and. It's, it, it, there, there, are two, there are two arguments here. One is the security of Belgium and the absence of a dominant power on the mainland of Europe is seen as central to Britain's strategic position. There can't be the equivalent of Napoleon facing Britain across the Channel and dominating Britain's routes to the rest of the world. The second issue is does it matter that Germany disregards its international obligations, enters Belgium, which is a neutral state, um, and fails to reflect both international law and the rights of, 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 of small nations? And the answer is it does matter. And it, do, it matters because, for Britain, international law and what we might now see as morality also matters. But it's more fundamental than that. Because Britain is, is an economic 
uh, power, a trading power, a power that depends on its shipping. Actually, international law is more than just a sense of, of, of legal or moral obligation. It's also a matter of economic necessity. You need to respect international law to make sure that Britain can continue to exercise the degree of leverage it does as a neutral itself. Well, some people say now, oh, it was incredibly silly for Britain to get involved in this horrific experience, the First World War, just because the German army marched into Belgium. But actually, it seems to me... It was a pretty good reason for going to war. It was an excellent reason for going to war, and it did something which, at the beginning of the July crisis, seemed unimaginable to many. United which is, the British people. It united the British people. It united the cabinet and it united the people. As Britain mobilised its little army in that first week of August, Germany's vast host was already surging into Belgium. Within days, the first reports appeared in the world's newspapers describing the extraordinarily brutal conduct of German troops towards the Belgian people. They were not merely carelessly destroying homes and villages. All invading armies do that. They were seizing and killing civilian hostages in scores and hundreds. Even before 1914, the Kaiser's army had earned a reputation for exceptional brutality. Between 1904 and 7, when the Herero and Nama tribes rebelled against German colonial rule in southwest Africa, the Kaiser soldiers killed or deliberately starved to death almost 100,000 native people. Wilhelm applauded and decorated the officer responsible. Even by the imperial standards of the day, this action was worse than any British excess. But the Herero genocide had been far away in Africa. In August 1914, world opinion was stunned by German savagery towards fellow Europeans. In Flanders, the destruction of the medieval university town of Louvain, today rebuilt from ashes, became a symbol of the excesses of the Kaiser's soldiers endorsed by Berlin. Professor John Horn has exhaustively researched and catalogued the German army's actions in Berlin and France during 1914. John, we're here in the University Library at Louvain. What happened here? Well, on the 25th of um, August, there was the sound of fighting, German soldiers shooting at what they claimed was a civilian insurrection. Round about 11 o'clock in the evening, this beautiful university library was broken into by the German soldiers and deliberately set fire. One young Jesuit, Father Duperieux, uh, had written in his notebook that he thought the Germans, in burning down the library, had done something as barbaric as the destruction of the Library of Alexandria in antiquity. This was seized by German soldiers and he was summarily executed. And by the 29th or the 30th, you have to imagine Louvain um, as an almost empty town the population that hadn't been deported gradually straggled back in to find between 1,500 and 2,000 buildings destroyed and well over 240 of their own townspeople had been killed. All armies in all wars can behave very badly. What seems different about what happened in Belgium in 1914 was that it wasn't just a question of, of the odd soldiers um, brutally murdering a few civilians. They were systematically shooting them in scores and sometimes in hundreds as hostages. You're quite right. But what we've just described in Louvain was a terrible incident and it immediately grabbed the international headlines. But it was typical of something that happened across the whole invasion front in Belgium and also in eastern France. And it wasn't the worst case in terms of the death rate. Dinan was destroyed as a town and 674 of its inhabitants executed uh, two days before. In cold blood. In cold, in, in, in cold blood. In the first weeks of the war, nearly 6,500 civilians were executed by German troops in Belgium and France. Berlin claimed that they were merely exacting legitimate reprisals for resistance by civilians, so-called franc-tireurs, but John Horn rejects this. You found no evidence at all of frontier activity, did you, of guerrilla activity against the Germans? None. 
it was, uh, apart from the odd, very isolated incident, but nothing which justified the German accusations, which was that there had been what they called a Volkskrieg, a people's war, a mass uprising. And the Kaiser, already by the 9th of um, August, only a week into the war, is accusing the King of the Belgians of fermenting such an uprising. It, it, it didn't happen. It was the institutional response of the German generals and right up to the Kaiser that seemed striking, and it does seem to say something about the character of the regime. That's right, because um, very quickly, um, what starts out as, as, as panics and localised responses by German soldiers is immediately um, endorsed by the whole German command structure. And then what swings into play is a series of very brutal reprisals which are justified in terms of German military doctrine as to what you do when you're faced with civilian uprising. For years, apologists for Germany claimed that the Belgian atrocities were figments of Allied propaganda. Some of the stories that made headlines in 1914, for instance, claims that thousands of babies were maimed by German soldiers, were indeed fabrications. But a big truth persists. The German army behaved with systemic barbarity during its advance across Belgium and France. Its actions persuaded many hitherto doubting British people that they had chosen the right side in the ghastly conflict that was unfolding. Some historians today claim that the British government's decision to go to war in defence of Belgium's neutrality was simply a fig leaf, a pretense, when really it was all simply about supporting the French against the Germans. I put it a bit differently. Yes, it's true that some key ministers wanted to fight anyway, but Belgium provided a tipping point. All sorts of British people who cared nothing for Serbia or Russia could easily get their minds around the notion that it was outrageous that the most powerful army in Europe proposed to crush beneath its boots a small state simply to serve the convenience of the Schlieffen plan. And wasn't that indeed a decent and honourable reason for Britain to go to war? Had Germany been victorious on the continent, Britain would have found itself in a desperate and lonely predicament. If the Germans had won, and now I hypothesise, there would have been an Anglo-German war within a matter of years. The fear in Britain was that a power which unified the continent would then be in a position to challenge Britain's command of the sea. If she commanded, uh, challenged and successfully overturned Britain's command of the sea, not only would we no longer have an empire, we would be at the mercy of whoever commanded the whole of Europe. That was what the British feared. That was what... And they were right to fear it. And they were right to fear it because there was a substantial element in Germany led by the Kaiser, whose one objective was to challenge Britain as a world power, to build a great navy which would then defeat the British and Germany would then become a world power at the expense of the British. So if the Germans had won the war, I see no way in which they would not have used their dominance of Europe to bring the British down. So we would not have avoided a war, we would only have postponed one. By early September, the German army had swept through Belgium and into France. With Berlin believing that its victory was imminent, Chancellor Bethmann Holweg drew up a list of his country's demands at the peace talks. They included seizing large swathes of land from both France and Russia, annexing Luxembourg, making Belgium and Holland vassal states. The September plan, as it became known, was designed to secure Germany's absolute political and economic control of Europe. But in the second week of September, the French army achieved a historic victory in the Battle of the Marne, driving back the Germans from the gates of Paris. What followed in the autumn of 1914 finally wrecked Germany's dream of swift victory. It also witnessed the first big and seriously bloody battle of the war for the British. In October, the British Expeditionary Force marched towards the old Belgian cloth town of Ypres, wipers, as millions of British soldiers came to know it. They arrived there just in time to clash head-on with a massive enemy offensive, the last great German effort to win the war by Christmas. What took place in the five weeks of battle around Ypres set the pattern for the vision of the First World War, which has been etched into our national culture ever since. Former soldier Clive Harris 
today guides visitors to the battlefields of the First World War, and especially those around Ypres. But you can see it's He's brought me to Polygon Wood, one of the most famous or notorious landmarks of the desperate struggle in 1914. It's right at the edge of the Menin Road, which runs back towards Ypres, which is about five, six kilometres behind us now. It sits right at the centre of the battlefield as well. So from the moment the Germans attack us on the 18th of October, right through to the last knockings of First Ypres on the 11th of November, this, this wood here and the two woods uh, just to the rear of us were key as part of the battlefield. This is where the Germans made their last huge push of 1914 to try and win the war before Christmas. They did, yeah. They now realise that they needed to knock us out of the war and by doing so they needed to capture the Channel ports and therefore they moved away from the von Schleifen plan to a degree and the capture of Ypres, this is the last thing other side of Ypres, there is no defences. It was our last chance. There is nothing behind us but the Channel ports. And there were battles all over the shop, small battles they were, all over the wood here. They were, yeah. We tend to think that the British line would be a continual line, when in fact it was more a series of outposts. And quite often units found themselves isolated and having to make small unit charges into Germans as opposed to a, a larger cohesive defence. Here in Western Belgium, the war of manoeuvre, ranging across thousands of square miles that had been waged through the late summer of 1914, gave way to a stalemate across the Western Front. The technology of defence and destruction, artillery and machine guns, had achieved a dominance which confounded the generals of both sides. At Ypres, Cavalrymen saw their horses almost for the last time before being obliged to join a death grapple on foot. Well, we're here. This is the uh, site of the Horse Guards Memorial, and it marks um, an area where the Horse Guards fight as infantry pretty much on this spot. We're just on the. Piece. So they came charging up, dismounted. Yeah, initially by horseback. The... This actual spot is where one of the machine gun positions, because it gives us a great arc of fire over advancing enemy. But what seems important here, Clive, it wasn't just that the British threw back the German army, it was also that the whole character of the war changed for all the armies, that here was where they first came to terms with what everybody now understands as the full horror of the Great War, wasn't it? Yeah, trench warfare, and this is the end of that war of movement that starts in the August, all the way down to the Marne, all the way back again, and it's here that we start to dig, dig, dig. So, yeah, we're on the spot where it changes. And when it started to rain... Yeah. They weren't in the earth, they were in the mud. Yeah, then you have to learn uh, to cope with things such as trench foot and how to get around that and reinforce your trenches to withstand bombardments. We're no longer going to see artillery now in front of the infantry firing as field guns. They're going to be behind the lines or certainly uh, in, in uh, sunken lanes and that sort of thing. And nobody dares show his head above the parapet? No, this is, we go subterranean from now on, that's right. Um, any movement by day would have been suicidal, yeah. But the British paid a devastating price for their narrow victory at Ypres. 56,000 British soldiers were killed or wounded in a month. The old professional British army was largely destroyed. Thereafter, it would be civilian volunteers and later conscripts who accounted for the overwhelming majority of the six million British soldiers who eventually served. But however terrible the sacrifice, it seems mistaken to imagine that there was ever an easy means by which the war could have been ended. Gentlemen, our long wait is nearly at an end. Tomorrow morning, General Insanity Belchip invites you to a mass slaughter. <laughs> We're going over the top. Well, huzzah and hurrah! The hugely successful Blackadder series epitomises the enduring popular view of the First World War, that the British Army fell victim to idiot commanders devoid of brains or courage. Well, best of luck to you all. Sorry I can't be with you, but obviously there's no place at the front for an old general with a dicky heart and a wooden bladder. <laughs> well, just just then. See you all in Berlin for coffee and cake. Most of the war's commanders really were pretty unlovable and unimaginative men. But once the most powerful industrial states in Europe were locked in strife, it seems wrong to imagine that even a Wellington or Napoleon could have found an easy road to victory. George Orwell wrote a generation later that the only way to end a war quickly is to lose it. He was right. The trench stalemate on the Western Front posed intractable problems which no commander proved able to solve. 
generals needed to be able to control their forces by telephone and could only do so from behind the front rather than at the head of their troops as on history's battlefields. But the price of long distance command was to create a divide between the top brass in their chateaus and their men calf deep in mud, which has made an enduring and bitter impact on posterity's view of the war. In the summer of 1918, Allied forces finally broke the stalemate on the Western Front and pushed east across France, with the British Army taking more prisoners than all their Allied partners put together. The Germans, exhausted and demoralized, fell back in growing disarray until an armistice was signed on the 11th of November. Around 10 million combatants, 900,000 of them from the British Empire, had lost their lives. Two months after the shooting stopped, the victorious Allies convened a peace conference at the Palace of Versailles outside Paris. Their task was enormous, their purposes the most ambitious in history. The Versailles summit has often since been branded a failure which condemned Europe to a further generation of strife. Prime Minister Lloyd George, French Premier Georges Clemenceau, and American President Woodrow Wilson led the negotiations involving delegations from many other interested nations, which lasted for six months between January and June 1919. Their intention was to produce a treaty that would not only reshape Europe, but also ensure that there could never again be a great war by disarming the Germans and making them pay the costs of the conflict. Historian Margaret Macmillan is the author of the most compelling and vivid modern narrative of what happened at Versailles. What was at stake for the Allied powers at Versailles? I think they had two things they had to think about. They were deeply concerned about the state of Europe and indeed their own countries included. There was real fear of revolution and they were worried that the situation might deteriorate. What was also at stake, of course, is they were democracies and they had to think of their publics. And the publics had been led to believe and had been kept going in the war by the promise that it was going to make a much better world. And so what they had to try and do is create a better world to appease. Incredibly ambitious objectives. It was, it was very ambitious, but then of course the First World War is so unusual compared to earlier wars because it was so exhausting that you couldn't just say at the end of it, well, that's it, done, we'll make a few border changes and we'll go back to normal. You couldn't go back to normal. I seem to remember that the Germans eventually paid less than they had made the French pay after they beat the French in 1871. What the Allies couldn't say to their own people was, look, there's no way Germany can pay what really we need to rebuild because they, their own people had suffered so much and so they had to put a bill in. But what they did was they fudged it. They divided the total reparations bill up, so the Germans only paid a fraction. Once they paid the fraction, they'd pay the rest, which, of course, the Germans never wanted to do. The Allies really failed afterwards to convince their own peoples that their cause had been just, didn't they? Well, I suppose the problem with the First World War is that the expectations are so high, the promises are so great, and he, all sorts of promises, as we know, are made during the war to try and keep people in the war. But there's no way that all those promises can be cashed in after the war is over. Abuse fell upon the Versailles Treaty almost before ink was dry on the signatures. The economist John Maynard Keynes, one of the British Treasury delegation, published a scathing broadside entitled The Economic Consequences of the Peace. A strong German sympathizer, Keynes made a case that the terms imposed upon Germany were both morally unjust and economically foolish. How influential was Maynard Keynes in his book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, which absolutely damned Versailles? It was very influential. I mean, he wrote it very quickly. It became a bestseller immediately, and it's been in print ever since. And it's a brilliant polemic. It's not fair. He paints this picture of these greedy, selfish, hard-hearted, cynical men dividing up Europe, punishing Germany, and they're just making a complete mess of it. I think there's also, he represents a whole generation of younger people who had supported the war, believing that the world was going to be a better place, and when they saw it wasn't going to be, they reacted and blamed the people who were trying to make peace for everything. I would have thought one of the huge unfairnesses of Keynes' book is that he never set it in the context of saying, all right, even if the Allies had made a fumbled, bungled peace, if the Germans had won, and if the Germans had been making the peace, it would have been a vastly crueler and worse one for Europe. 
Well, I think there's plenty of evidence that what the German high command, and they were basically in control of Germany by this point. By 1918, you had a military dictatorship in Germany. And what they were planning were pretty extensive annexations of other people's lands in the West. And in the East, they were planning to extend their influence. They, in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, they had forced the Bolsheviks, who were desperate, to give over whatever gold they had left. They'd set up an independent Ukraine. I mean, the evidence is, unless they'd had a complete change of heart, it would have been a very harsh peace. Today, an awful lot of people have come to feel a real guilt about the Treaty of Versailles. Oh, it was an unfair treaty to Germany that it contributed to the rise of Hitler. Got it wrong. Was it the harsh vindictive treaty they claim? The trouble with the treaty, I think, is that it appeared to be harsher than it actually was. And of course, it was all about implementation. And in the end, most of those clauses which limited German power and forced Germany to pay reparations were not really implemented fully. And so I think there's, there's a perception of the treaty is very harsh. My question always is, is what would you have done otherwise? How would you have treated Germany if you felt it had caused the war and caused this catastrophe for Europe? What would you have done? Wouldn't you have tried to limit its power? Because Versailles failed to deliver a lasting peace, it has become unjustly blamed for the fact that a Second World War had to be fought. In truth, so many violent forces and crises shook Europe between 1919 and 1939 that it seems absurd to blame the peacemakers for having failed in their grand purposes. In the decade following Versailles, all Europe groaned under the burden of paying the bills for the past conflict. Britain was almost bankrupt, and the moral and political regeneration which Prime Minister Lloyd George had repeatedly promised failed to happen. Many men came back from the army to find their old jobs taken by civilians, often women. Whereas in 1945, veterans returned to a country run by a Labour government committed to creating a welfare state, after 1918, the old gang remained in charge of an unreformed British society. Those who had fought felt that they had been sold a full spill of goods. My own grandfather, a writer who won a military cross as a gunner officer in France, became one of those who, within a few years of the armistice, asked himself what it had all been for. Here's an essay my grandfather wrote for a literary magazine in 1923 after meeting a group of fellow veterans who'd served with him in France. They now felt, he said, that they had gone, not as heroes, but on a fool's errand, to fight in a war that was not worth fighting. They'd endured the unsightly, dirty life of the battlefields with a cheery and modest sense of merit, with a belief that they were making some contribution to a good cause. But now, it transpired, this had been a stupid article of faith, which was exploded. My grandfather and his kind felt themselves strangers in a strange land, divided by the horrendous trench experience from those at home who knew almost nothing about it. The poets of the Western Front, such men as Wilfred Owen, Robert Graves, Siegfried Sassoon, vividly described its horrors and the sense of military futility in a fashion that later generations have found irresistible. Here was the world's worst wound, and here, with pride, their name liveth forevermore, the gateway claims. Was ever an immolation so belied as these intolerably nameless names? Well might the dead who struggled in the slime rise and deride this sepulchre of crime. But Sassoon and his kind never addressed the huge question of how on earth Britain could have escaped from the war except by conceding defeat. It's a weird British thing that while we're hugely proud that our forefathers fought Hitler, we seem almost ashamed that they fought the Kaiser. How has the overwhelming perception developed in Britain over the last hundred years that there was nothing worth fighting about in the First World War? Well, the interesting point is not so much that after the war, opinion changed or opinion veered to the point when it said that was a bad war, it was badly conducted, it was a waste of time, a waste of blood, and it should never have happened. Nobody thought that in 1918. 
I think nobody thought that for another 10 years, until about 1928 and The poets did. The poets did, but the interesting thing is whether people would have been interested and affected by what the poets wrote. They became expressive of a public opinion in 1928. They weren't expressive in, in 1918. By the end of the 1920s, there's this worldwide slump, total catastrophic unemployment everywhere, especially in Germany. The situation seemed to be far worse in 1928 than it had been in 1914. And by 1933 or so, it has become generally accepted that the war was an unnecessary war, that it had been bungled, etc., etc. So I think that what was very, very important was not so much the fact that the war had been terribly expensive and bloody and the losses were awful. It was that nothing seemed to have come out of it of any good. Europe's descent into the turmoil and privations of the 1930s caused many people to view the Great War as bungled, the peace shambolic. Some perversely blamed the victors for the rise of Hitler and Nazism. While many people today still think of the First World War as a bad war, the Second has come to be seen by contrast as a virtuous crusade against the Nazi architects of genocide. Nobody went to war in 1939 to stop the Germans massacring the Jews. I mean, sad though, maybe you said that partly because, of course, the serious massacres hadn't yet begun, uh, but principally because Germany might be doing awful things, Nazi Germany, domestically. But in those days, nobody saw that uh, as an obligation to go to war in the way in which we would today. Um, so, in some respects, both wars break out for similar reasons. Great power rivalries and the concerns of, of the balance of power within Europe and what is happening within Eastern Europe, they're remarkably similar in their causation. And it is perverse that we have closed the, the Second World War as the good war and the First World War as the bad war. Uh, and, and, of course, we have not remained sufficiently, I'm talking we as British now, have not remained sufficiently independent-minded or sufficiently historically aware uh, to put these things in, in our own and a proper context. No sane person believes that Britain wanted a war in 1914. All the great powers bear some responsibility for the carnage, but the Germans seem to deserve most because they refused to use their almost indisputable ability to prevent it. They failed to see that nothing they hoped to get out of the war could justify its horrendous prospective risk and actual cost. Britain emerged from the First World War with little to show save a few worthless colonies and a host of public memorials. But the right questions to ask about the conflict and the nation's sacrifice today are whether we could justly or sensibly have stayed out of it. And what would have befallen Europe if the Kaiser's Germany had won? I'm imagining Whitehall as it was on the 4th of August jam with expectant people about to be swept away by the most dreadful cataclysm in European history. Nobody in their right mind would suggest making the centenary of 1914 an occasion for celebration. But we should have the courage to tell our children and grandchildren that the wartime generation did not fight and die for nothing. That if their enemies had prevailed, Europe would have paid an even more terrible forfeit.